It's the morning of August 8th, 2024, and the campus is quiet. As the air heats, the leaves crisp and the bricks bake, and most students are asleep at home in the air conditioning, clinging to the final days of summer. At 9.45, the first cars roll into the senior lot. By 10, silence is only a memory. <laughs> The theater kids have arrived. Welcome to Bear in Mind, Harpeth Hall's official podcast. My name is Nora Wong, class of 2021, and I'll be today's host. In this episode, I journey into the depths of the Francis Bond Davis Theater, where Harpeth Hall and MBA students are hard at work on the upcoming production of Mamma Mia. I can hear the music from the Marnie Sheridan Gallery even before I walk into Morrison's studio. What I see is slightly disturbing, but not unexpected. My little sister dancing with a boy. She crosses the stage and turns back to mime shooting him with an invisible bow and arrow. He clutches his chest, falling to his knees. That's enough, I thought. I did what any older sister must do. I grabbed both of them and pulled them into an office for an interrogation. I hand each of them a mic. I can tell that my sister is wondering what I'm going to ask. I feel somewhat bad for putting her fake fiancé on the spot, so I start with the easy questions. I'm Louisa, and I play Sophie, and she has a very bubbly, fun personality, but she can also be kind of naive, especially when she invites her three possible dads to her wedding one day before and hopes that she'll know which one it is right away. I'm Lorenzo. Uh, I'm playing Sky, and he's just as happy as Sophie that this whole wedding's happening, but he is a lot busier for Sophie's mom, Donna, setting up the wedding, and there's a lot going on with him, and it is, of course, very overwhelming for him to figure out this whole scenario that Sophie has set up. I raise my eyebrows at my sister. That wasn't so bad, was it? I ask more about Sophie and Sky's relationship. How does it develop throughout the show? Louisa answers first. In the first half of the production, there are lots of cute moments like honey, honey, and lay all your love on me. Especially in the second act, there's a lot of different emotions added into there. Like, there's some pretty big fights and um, um, other moments. <laughs> then it resolves with a wedding, so it's fine. Yeah, but um, <laughs> it's really interesting to like see how these characters who are normally super positive and having fun with each other um, go through moments like that. As important as Sophie and Skye's connection is, there's a relationship that's even more central, the dynamic between Sophie and her mother, Donna. Near the end, in slipping through my fingers, you see the kind of the connection between Donna and Sophie um, as a, a mother and daughter, because before that, you don't really get to see them spend much time together, but I think that's a really sweet moment where you can see how much they really care about each other. It's so applicable and approachable to every generation, especially of women. That's Ms. Bromfield, the show's director. Whether you identify with Sophie and what she's going through and this idea of new and exciting love, or if you're identifying with Donna, who has lived her life fighting and had romances back in the day, but she's chosen a different life, that's, to me, what makes this such a fun, but also real show for so many people. And that's really the core of the show. Though the plot is silly and far-fetched, the characters and their relationships have what one of my writing professors would call the bite of the real. How do the creative minds behind the musical strike this balance? Well, first they looked at the music, and then they looked at themselves. Let's get into the music first. When Judy Kramer first met former ABBA members, Benny Anderson and Bjorn Ulvaeus in the 80s, she was an executive producer on a musical they were developing. She approached Anderson and Ulvaeus and pitched an idea, a television special using ABBA songs as a framework. They did not go for it. In an oral history published by Vogue in 2022, Ulvaeus said, quote, I thought ABBA was dead, maybe not into oblivion, but forgotten, like so many other groups of that era. ABBA was frowned on so much in the 80s that it was almost uncomfortable. The band, which was a hit in the 70s, received criticism after they broke up in 1982, and popular music styles shifted. But Judy didn't give up. 
Over 10 years later, Anderson and Ulvaeus agreed. Judy could use their songs in an original musical, as long as they liked the story. They had no idea what a commercial success the musical would be, spawning a movie adaptation that catapulted ABBA songs to the top of the charts. As I researched, I tried to put myself in Judy's shoes. She was so close to her goal, but everything depended on her ability to produce the right plot. The first thing she did was meet with writer Katherine Johnson. One person might help us get a small glimpse of what it was like for Judy and Catherine as they puzzled over potential storylines. I went to talk to Mr. Files, the music director of Harpeth Hall's upcoming show. Could you say something? Really yeah, good? testing, testing, testing. Perfect. All right, everything looks good. Okay. Um, so my first question is, thinking about a production like Mamma Mia, where the music wasn't written specifically for this story and was kind of repurposed after the fact, um, how is that different, and how are you kind of approaching this production um, with that in mind? Sure. So, jukebox musicals, which this is one, are they're kind of their own breed of shows. With a lot of musicals, we are spending a lot of time um, reimagining how it might sound based on what's written down on paper and looking back at past productions, maybe even changing the orchestrations or the ranges and adding our own artistic slant to it. But with the jukebox show, you kind of have a responsibility to deliver on what the audience expects. So in this case, everyone knows Dancing Queen. Everyone knows Mamma Mia. And so we have to go through and as we're learning the music, walk that fine line of having it be what's expected without ever letting it be predictable. Mr. Piles had to figure out how to coach the students singing so it matched the pop style of the music, but also served the storyline. His problem was, how do I take something everyone knows and do something new with it? Judy and Catherine faced the same challenges, but amplified. In an interview with the Thrasher Horn Center, Judy explained that one thing that helped them devise the storyline was that all the best ABBA songs seemed to naturally fall into two categories. They noticed that the songs, quote, fell into two different generations, the slightly younger, playful songs like Honey Honey and Dancing Queen, and the more mature, emotional songs such as The Winner Takes It All and Knowing Me, Knowing You. This dichotomy was what made them decide to focus on a multi-generational love story. What else did they do to make the characters believable? They looked at themselves. Judy and Catherine teamed up with director Phyllida Lloyd. The three of them bonded quickly. Judy once remembered, quote, It was unusual, if not unheard of, for three women to be the collaborative force behind what was to become such a commercial success. Their dynamic ended up influencing the close relationship between three of the characters in the story, Donna and her two best friends, collectively known as Donna and the Dynamos. I'm here with Donna, played by Shelby, Tanya, played by Kiki, and Rosie, played by Larkin. Donna is Sophie's mom, and she owns the Taverna. I would say she's very headstrong and stubborn and very confident and sure of herself. Tanya is one of Donna's friends. She used to be a performer. She's had three husbands, very wealthy <laughs> husbands, and now she just rocks around in her stilettos. Rosie is one of Donna's old friends, um, and she is a writer of cookbooks. Short and kooky is usually what <laughs> is written to describe her. And she, we call her cargo shorts because we think that really encapsulates her vibe. You three are probably spending a lot of time together doing rehearsal. You're playing three best friends. Yes. Um, so how has that been? What is your relationship like off stage, and how are you preparing to play people that are this close? Oh, we're already best friends. Yeah. We, we, yeah, oh, okay. So, I would say it. that we're, we were really close coming into this process, and I think the past school year, we didn't know it, but we were kind of preparing for this yeah. the whole year because mm -hmm. we, we had were two in the classes. Same, we were in the same dance class together, okay. and we were in the same studio theater class together, so we were acting and dancing, the three of us, kind of in a trio, almost every day. Yeah, if not every and day. And the studio theater class only had six people. So right. it was like, oh, wow. we made so up half of very yeah. And yeah. so yeah. we got to be really close friends and we um, all have had similar training in the past mm -hmm. year for this kind of production. And so we are very excited to show our trio. It's a little bit different of a dynamic in the show than we actually have, but yeah, it's very fun. Yeah. Yes, of course, casting is about skill, skills in acting, singing and dancing. But it's also about intangible things like chemistry, something much more unpredictable. Sometimes you start a show and 
you have cast members who really don't know each other and you're building that. Um, this one particularly, and it's just the way the cards fell when they auditioned and that you could see the chemistry, especially the three dynamos we have. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is getting them to trust and they have what they already have with each other. It's like, don't try to put this on like, oh, I'm supposed mm -hmm. to play it this way or so that it's like, what does friendship mean to you? Why wouldn't it be the same for someone who's 50? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's the same. Like when they see each other, they go back to that youth. And so that's, I've been lucky. And then the students already have some of that built in. Were you guys friends before this? We, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're like really close friends. Us and Lorenzo okay. go back to like freshman year. Gotcha. And I've known Loren I personally have known Lorenzo since like the second grade. Mm -hmm. We went to Innsworth together before MBA. And so, yeah, it's really, we were joking around before this, like, nothing is going to get done yeah. because <laughs> we're so tight and we we joke around with each other so much. But I think that'll be nice for, like, the chemistry and, and such. I, I think I'm, I met Ethan probably in seventh grade, but we really, I remember, I think at least for me, getting really close in the eighth grade production of Androcles and Androcles the Lion. Androcles and the Lion, Which baby. was... A, <laughs> An adventure. Um, oh, and then yes. Philip, we met him freshman year. Yeah, I moved from California, oh, and I was right. kind of the, the new kid. And we didn't like him at first. Yeah. <laughs> I had English I class with him, and it was it was a trip. Yeah, it, was, it was a little weird at first, but uh, he you dialed know, in. They warmed up to me. I locked in. Um, you know, sophomore year, knew me. It got better. And now, you know, you fixed your posture You're here. too. Did I? Yeah, you fixed your posture. Let's go. So my name is Philip, and I play Bill. And Bill is kind of this confident dude. He's kind of like a, a lone wolf. He's a loner. He comes on a boat and brings the guys with him. And, and yeah, he travels a lot as well. Hi, uh, I'm Ethan Durham. I play Harry. So Harry is like the silly dad. He used to be a rock star and, or an aspiring rock star more realistically. And then eventually he just kind of settles down and becomes I think an accountant or like a banker. And um, he gets, he like all the other dads, gets a letter from what they think is Donna, from <clears throat> Donna's daughter. Right. He's just kind of there to have fun. Mm -hmm. And are you the one who's doing the accent? Yes. Oh my God, I'm British. That's important. Yes. I'm from London. I'm British in the show. <laughs> yes, I'm British. Wow. All right, awesome. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Owen. I'm playing Sam. He's an architect. He's in his 40s. And when he gets the letter from who he believes is Donna, he hopes to rekindle the love that they had 20 years ago. He's awesome. divorced. He's also, yes, divorced father of two. Okay, so um, very conversational. What is it like to play people who are so much older than you are now? Should we just like, like yeah. one at a time? Or? You can go all at once, just conversation. Time. Well, the last two musicals I played like a 50 year old and a, like <laughs> an 80 year old or oh something. Oh my goodness. And then the musical before that I played someone's dad. So I'm, I'm a bit experienced in the dad department. Mm -hmm. But um, it's pretty, it's fun because you get to be a bit more corny and it's more believable yeah. because, you know, dads are like cheesy, they're hammy, they, they do all like the dumb stuff <laughs> that embarrasses you and you kind of get to do that and, right. you know, to be courageous, to be free and you, you get to be free. More in the, like similar to what Ethan just said, like I've seen all the stuff that my dad has done that's made me like kind of hide my face and like cringe, but now mm -hmm. I get to do that and it's really fun. Just getting to kind of be that, like, again, it's cringe and it's a little weird, but that's, like, what we're supposed to be doing. Right. Um, this is Philip, and I usually don't play older characters um, that much. So when I got this role, I was like, okay, this is going to be an interesting choice. Um, I don't know what, like, if I should do anything with my voice that's different or if my mannerisms should be different with my uh, moving my body. But I feel like as, as we work through the rehearsals, uh, we're all slowly figuring out uh, what to do and how to play these characters. And so we've introduced the main characters. But one other crucial aspect of Mamma Mia is the spectacle of it all, and this show won't disappoint. The costume crew is hard at work in the basement. An outside contractor was hired to help build the framework of the sets, which include three buildings and a working balcony. And of course, I can't forget the amazing ensemble cast, a group of talented and dedicated singers, dancers, and actors. As amazing as the leads, costumes, and sets will be, the ensemble members are the ones that bring the show to life and make everything believable. They make up the bulk of the huge dance numbers that inject energy into the story.
Speaking of dance, choreographer Julia Eisen told me to be on the lookout for familiar moves from the movie and the original Broadway show. I studied the movie um, over the summer and I tried to find as many clips from the actual uh, original Broadway show. And so I tried to bring in some little um, special moments where I definitely took from the, the Broadway show. Um, there's a, def a specific move in um, Dancing Queen that I hope people kind of okay. see, a little hidden um, gem in there from the Broadway musical, and um, definitely some things from the movie. So very mm -hmm. inspired from both the Broadway show and the, the movie. In the song Lay All Your Love on Me, the flippers, are, those are in the movie, right? Yes, right? yes. Okay. And they're also, I don't know if they're in the Broadway show, but... Um, I, they're definitely in the movie, so they're coming on stage, and I am very excited. So fun. <laughs> the boys are very <laughs> excited for the flippers, so. We're going to have to source all of those Yes, somewhere. and for sure. that little part, they um, there's some also hidden gems of some ballet. I tried to get them okay. to do a little ballet moment from uh, <laughs> Swan Lake, so I'm very excited about yeah, that. The Incredible, last dancey like, dancey strip. show that we've done is You're in, You're town. in town. Which was when I was a freshman. Yeah, exactly. So that's definitely right. something so to So these are like out. numbers that you can expect. High energy, dancing, mm -hmm. lots of people on stage. Just kind of what people think of yeah. as musical theater. Big, right, right. Jazz handsy numbers. And so mm -hmm. those will be really fun for the audience, I think. And it's super interactive with the audience. Yeah. Really. Like, We're dancing, always like talking Just get excited. Crowd. Just yeah. get excited. Exactly. Yeah. The, You're in for a treat. The fourth wall gets broken <laughs> quite <laughs> frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great songs, exciting dance, and a silly yet compelling storyline. Mamma Mia has it all. And so does this cast. I've heard countless stories of how close they've gotten and about how much they appreciate their directors, um, choreographers, and everybody else that has made this possible. Now, the only thing left is for you to come and see their show. It's ABBA, so everyone likes... I feel like I once heard someone say, Ava is like a litmus test for whether you have love in your heart. Like if you like it, you do. And if you don't, you just don't have any joy in your soul. So I personally really like Ava, which means I have joy in my soul. And mm -hmm. so I'm having a really good time with the show. Just getting to sing all these songs that I've known for like so long that everybody knows really and loves. And um, yeah, it's fun.